A very good morning and warm welcome to distinguished guests, respected principal, vice principals, teachers, all the participants, and my dear students. It's my privilege to welcome you all for the national webinar on ecosystem sustainability organized by the Department of Botany, Jyoti Nivas College, Autonomous Bangalore. As quoted in the Athar Veda, Mata Bhumi. Uttroham Prathviya, Earth is my mother and I am her child. The greatest threat to our mother Earth is the belief that someone else will save it. Quote by Robert Swan. We must remember that we do not inherit the Earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. The United Nations theme of World Environment Day 2021 is ecosystem restoration. Today's webinar is one step from our department to create awareness about the need to care for the nature. On that note, I would like to call Dr. Anand Raju to welcome our guest speakers and participants for today's webinar. It's indeed my privilege and honor to welcome one and all for this national webinar on ecosystem sustainability. On behalf of Jyotinivas College Autonomous, on behalf of our respected principal, Dr. Sister Lalita Thomas, on behalf of the Department of Botany and the technical staff, I welcome our resource persons, Mrs. Shubha Ramachandran and Mr. Samir Shishodia. I also extend a warm welcome to all the teaching fraternity, research scholars, industrialists, young and vibrant students who have logged in across the nation. As always, the good things are started by lighting the lamp. The and, and of course, seeking the blessings of the Almighty. May I please request our beloved principal to light the lamp, followed by a prayer by Dr. Ansi David. All glory be to God. We thank you for all the many blessings you have showered on us. As we start this venture, grant us your wisdom and guidance as we go through this webinar, which is meant to share and spread knowledge and empower all. Bless our principal, Dr. Sister Larita Thomas, who has lent her support and guidance. We submit our organizers all those involved in trying to make this endeavors of us a success. Bless our institution, our students, speaker, and the participants. We thank you for keeping us safe and bringing us together on this virtual platform. May your presence go with us, Amy. Thank you, sister, for lighting the lamp and leading us to the path of knowledge and wisdom. I also thank my colleague, Dr. Ansi David, for invoking the blessings of the Almighty. May I now request our respected principal and the chief patron of today's webinar, Dr. Sister Lalitha Thomas, to address the gathering. This is a very beautiful morning, and I'm happy to be here with you all through the virtual platform. I extend a warm welcome to our resource persons, Ms. Shubha and Mr. Samir. Thank you for being with us, I'm sure. With your valuable experience, you will inspire, motivate, and encourage all the participants today to get connected with our Mother Nature. 
I must congratulate our botany department for creating a space virtually to befriend our ecosystem and learn how to sustain it. I have a request to make to all the participants at this moment. Let this not remain just an academic activity. Instead, we develop a will to make it a reality and an experience for oneself. I believe, and all of us, God designed a world in which nature takes care of us, and God intended for us to care for it in return. Individual actions that can strengthen your connection with nature include just simple things, caring for house plants and growing your own food, you can. If you want to improve your relationships with each other and with the natural world, it is said, it is simply a service of caring for our common home. Cherish all creatures with love and respect. And if you want to learn, learn about tangible ways to protect biodiversity. And today is a time for you to get educated. As a simple habit of mindfulness, consider giving thanks for the resources and labor that goes into each of our means. Decide today, think about it. Rejecting the throwaway culture to recognize the need for changes in our lifestyle. In the introduction, much was said about our Mother Earth. I'm standing on our Mother Earth and she is holding me. And I simply love her, respect her, honor her. The power of soil. The soil enhances our well being. It simply rejuvenates and refreshes all the time. Soil is the backbone of our food security. Without healthy soils, farmers wouldn't be able to provide us with food and fuel. Soils are homes for many other organisms like insects that lay and hatch eggs in the soil. The best china dishes are made from soil. Soil is the foundation of our buildings, roads, houses, and our schools and colleges. In fact, soil affects how buildings are made. Soil holds Earth's history, containing artifacts, from dinosaurs to ancient human civilizations from Earth's past. There is a lot of history stored in our soil. Soil is non-renewable natural resource. It's very important that we know that. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization, it says it can take hundreds to thousands of years to form a centimeter of soil. But that single centimeter of soil can be lost in a single year due to erosion. So it is our bounden duty to take care of our home in which we live. I want to conclude this morning my interaction with you with this quote that I love so much about the nature. Forget not that the earth delights to feel our bare feet and the winds long to play with our hair. Look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. It has answer to all our queries. Heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. I bow down to our mother nature and I thank God for this powerful energy of sustaining the human kind with the whole cosmos and enriching our lives on this earth. 
I love the sound of rain. I love the sound of wind. And I love the smell of earth. I am the child of the nature. Wish you all the very best. God bless all the participants. May you have enriching sessions. May you fall in love with the nature and care for it. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, sister. Measures to mitigate the environmental crisis and having ecological sustenance is the need of the hour. Thank you, sister, for that wonderful message that clearly defines the issues related to ecosystem. That brings us to the first session of today's webinar. Our first distinguished speaker is Mrs. Shubha Ramachandran, a civil engineer from IIT Mumbai. Shubha is a team lead in Biome Environmental Trust and has designed and implemented several rainwater harvesting techniques and wastewater treatment systems in and around Bangalore. At Biome, she has been working on understanding the groundwater, wastewater and wetlands. She is a TEDx speaker and has represented Biome in 2019 at World Water Week in Stockholm. With that brief introduction, I request Shubha Madam to take over and deliver a talk on Million Wells for Bengaluru. It's over to you, Madam. Good morning, everybody. And sincere thanks for uh, inviting to the principal, staff, students of the college for inviting me for this presentation. Uh, it is indeed very relevant in today's times and we have to see how uh, It's very important for us to see how the ecosystem, the planet that we inhabit, how do we do it as sustainably as possible? And while we, we, when we think of the planet, our thoughts are around the trees and the fishes and the environment, but it's a lot about the different people who live there, the laws of the land, uh, the financials that are involved. So given the current context, how do we really live sustainably on the planet and leave a sustainable planet for our future generations as well? So I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the Biome Environmental Trust and uh, Biome Environmental Trust. Uh, a little bit about what we do at the trust. It's a group of uh, architects, engineers, social scientists who are really trying to see that even when we live in a city, what are the things that we can do such that we are able to live with as small a footprint as possible? So that could be in terms of the water that we use. How do we bring water from as local sources as possible? As you can see in the images, if we are building, how do we build with local materials? Because in sustainable, a large part of sustainability is in making sure that we are not expending too much energy for any of our activities. So when we build houses, we try and take soil that is available uh, when we dig for the foundation and below from the particular site itself. The bricks that are made are sun dried so that you're not burning a kiln, burning coal or logs in a in a kiln, but you're actually making bricks with as less energy as possible. You're harvesting rain when possible because the rain falls directly on top of your head, is available for free, and you can actually get it for a lot lesser energy. So those are the thoughts. As a group, there is we work in urban areas with resident welfare associations. We work with schools, colleges, uh, government schools in rural areas. Uh, so that's largely the nature of the organization. So coming quickly to and today my focus on sustainability is very specific to water because like we all say Jal hai to jeevan hai. It, it's one of these things, one of the elements of nature that are most required for us to carry on with our daily lives. So in such a context, if we step back and see uh, how where does all our water come from? So some of us, uh, I'm, I, I heard that there are participants from all over the country today. Uh, so each one of us, it's useful to think where is it that we are getting our water from? Uh, in most cases, as we shall see, each city gets its water from a river. But do we know which point in the river is a river or a reservoir? How far away is that reservoir and what is the kind of energy that we are spending to bring that water to our particular city? So here are a few examples. There you see Chennai is coming from almost 
235 kilometers away, the point from where water is drawn. For Bangalore, it's 95. Delhi, it comes from 405 from the Tehri Dam. That's so much further away. Going ahead, it, it's true for all the cities in the country right now. Hyderabad, water from 100 kilometers away. Yeah, that's Bombay. That's also close to 100 kilometers away. In many of the cities uh, here coming specifically to Bangalore, it's not only the distance of about 100 kilometers, but the water is pumped through a great height of about 500 meters. In many of the cities, water sometimes flows through gravity, but there's a fair bit of energy that also has, be, has to be expended to pump this water up to the city. And at the same time, and this is what would be the focus of our discussion today, is to see that traditionally how are people getting water uh, largely, as we will see, it has been groundwater. Groundwater has been a major source of water for the country, not just for the country as you look around for the entire world. And where groundwater was available at 5, 10, 15 feet below ground level, extracted from structures that are open wells. And what has happened over a period of time, so the, here are just a few images of wells as people in urban areas also step out and discover what these wells can be like, how do you recharge them? How does it then become a source of water? Uh, and in the city, however, if you were to ask most people and not just the city, even in the villages, what is the source of water? If we are not getting water that is being supplied by some kind of water supply authority, often it is through bore wells. How deep are these bore wells? These bore wells are going down right now as deep as 2000 feet into the ground as well. And with lots of energy, five HP motors, 15 HP motors, horsepower motors is what this water is being extracted from, from such great depths. And, or sometimes this water, despite being extracted from a bore well, because there is no bore well in the vicinity, is then loaded onto a tanker and then the tanker drives along uh, expending diesel to come to our specific houses and give us this water. So when we look at all of that, the real simple answers are to see, do I really need? Yes, perhaps I do need to go far away to, to a river, get my water. Yes, I do dig, need to dig deep because water is not available at shallow depths always. But at the same time, do I think of the water that's falling right on top of my head? So here are, I've purposely picked a few images that are really very simple that speak to you about the idea of rainwater harvesting. So the, the image on the top left, which just has a pot and a sari, that's not something that, or even of the one that's on the left at the bottom, that's an image from Kerala. Uh, these are rainy places, but still drinking water is not always easily available. So what the women there are doing is that they've just tied up the sari, there's a bucket below that. And in the same, the rain, the rain that falls just on the sari is filtered through that, stored in the bucket, and then used for drinking and cooking purposes. So uh, as you all can imagine, rainwater is really the purest form of water. We have to take care of a few uh, contaminants that might be there, which is really very simple, but it harvest, if harvested and stored, it can be used for a long period of time. And there are a few technicalities. We shan't get into it now, but the whole idea to bring along is to see is that this water comes to us with the least amount of energy and is the purest form of water. When we get water from a bore well, like I mentioned, we are pumping it from great depths. We have to soften it often because the water is hard. Uh, so, so the water we estimate actually costs, if you look at the pumping and the treatment costs, costs anywhere between 20 to 25 uh, rupees for every thousand of lit thousand liters of water when we get it from bore wells. From open wells, the water is a lot cheaper. And when I say cheaper, it's not only about the finances, but the energy that goes into the water. The water, for instance, that we get in Bangalore from the river Kaveri that I mentioned about earlier, costs the city almost 95 rupees to pump up every thousand liters of water to us. And when they provide it to us, it's sold to us at about six to eight rupees per thousand liters. So there's a lot of subsidy and a lot of complexities that comes in when we don't look at the resources that are available to us very locally, very cheaply, which can actually be used in very sustainable, low energy manners. So coming down, since we were speaking about groundwater, I thought we'll just spend a little time to understand how our interaction has been with groundwater so far. So the water, if you, if you look at an open well, unlike the images that I showed you earlier, it's nothing but a hole in the ground, which gives you access to water. 
of course it's not available in all places but what it really provides you is in the, it, it, the ground if you look at it is really like a large tank in various parts of the country it's just waiting to be filled with water you can still carry on your activities on top but where required if you were to dig a well that water is then available to you water that is often soft and sweet so there are no minerals dissolved in it but yes there is need to make sure that the water is filtered and used appropriately uh, a few imaginations just to say so this is uh, from the indus valley civilization this particular well that you see so wells were around from then itself coming a little into the uh, not so further past this is the well at sarnath uh, it's it is from the 500 bc it's estimated perhaps buddha drank water from this well so that's how old this well is and these wells still exist this well still has water in it um and even when you read the rock edicts of ashoka the things that were often prescribed were to plant trees to make sure the soil is well to make sure that wells are dug as a source of water so as much as we saw the well as a source of water what we also now realize is why were those wells so full of water and what is it that we can do to ensure that these wells continue to be full of water over a long period of time uh, coming a little bit more into the future uh this is at mahabalipuram a well and in fact we find wells at various temples this is uh, the hampi uh, the well at hampi which which holds water and across the country if you look at gujarat rajasthan all parts of the country wells have gone by different names and have always been sources of water and a few illustrations these are practices that are fast moving out a bore well makes it a lot easier for us to pump out water because all we need is a motor once the well is dug the motor is switched on and we get water a lot of these structures initially had mechanical ways so this is called a, a some of you might have seen it there are various forms by which human or cattle energy was used to extract water from the ground it this may not necessarily be the way that it has to be carried out even now uh, we still can use the motors and pumps to be able to pump out that water coming closer home this is a well in bangalore uh, and in fact this is near the jakur lake if we go closer to your uh, jyotinavas college in koramangala it's surprising the groundwater is available even at 8 to 10 feet in many places around the college campus itself and slowly people are seeing the value in using the well water as well uh, as much as bangalore this is bombay i just thought we'll pick a few examples and i'll soon get to the point about why are we speaking about open wells so much and uh, what how really does that contribute to sustainability so this is bombay bombay one would imagine because our tradition our current imagination of open wells is as something that's uh, old ancient maybe uh, people who don't have access to technology that's the source of water that they rely on but if you look at these are all images from bombay that's a tanker that actually fills up from that open well and supplies water in various parts of the city as well uh, the lower bottom image where there's a vegetable vendor he is actually sitting on top of a well so the well is right behind him and he can use water from that well too not just our country i picked a few images that's the well opposite the qutub minar in delhi there's a well from jharkhand there's a well in norway across the country wells have been sources of water but the strange thing is how quickly not just in our country we all forgotten about the open wells completely they are largely used now as dustbins uh, or the land it's filled up and the so and the area that's available on top of the well then is used to build houses or it's just used as real estate so in such a context and if you look and why does it become even more important for our country we can spend some time on this graph uh, what we see is that um, if you look at groundwater extraction starting from the 1940s to the 2010 india's groundwater extraction has significantly increased since the 1970s we are now the largest extractor of groundwater and not just larger we larger than the three top countries put together so we are extracting more groundwater than china and the us put together and now obviously that brings to point that if we if we are so dependent on groundwater a few further slides would further kind of demonstrate that to you if you look in rural india 
almost all the when I say drinking water, it's all the domestic water is coming from groundwater alone. Yeah, 80 to 90, 95 percent of drinking water in the villages is coming from groundwater. Agriculture, even though we are building dams and canals, 60 to 70 percent of agriculture is using groundwater. In the cities, even in our own city in Bangalore, more though we think water comes from the river Kaveri, we are actually using more than 50 percent of groundwater. And the strange part of this is it's not even well understood what is the kind of groundwater at a very local level if you were to go around find out how many bore wells there are in the city what is the kind of extraction that's happening those numbers are not always very well known in this image just to highlight not just for humans but for animals too the source of water is often groundwater whether it be in uh, parks reserve forests the source is water and what really happens in our cities this is just to say that when we are a small town most small towns have small reservoirs or surface water bodies that are used for uh, groundwater uh, that are used as a source of water and there is also some extraction from groundwater. But the point that I'm trying to make is even as you become a much larger city, what you see is that as your water overall water demand goes up, your surface water use significantly goes up. That's the blue line that you see, but your groundwater use also goes up, which is often unacknowledged. So what really happens is even though we are going from always we're relying on surface water and groundwater as our water demand becomes much higher in a city, we are still relying on those two sources of water and a lot more groundwater extraction happens. And the thing about groundwater is that uh, it's a source at some time. It's also a sink at some time. So the, the it's like you have a large reservoir available for you below the earth and how you want to treat it, what kind of water you want to put into it, what, what and that will in turn decide for you the quality of water that you're going to be extracting from that source as well. Um, yeah, this is just to kind of uh, put in that same point that in 71 of our bigger cities, more than about 50% of water is coming from groundwater. So just to emphasize the point that we don't think about groundwater as much perhaps because we can't see it, especially when it's coming from a bore well. You can't even look into a bore well to see how much water there is, and that often leads to large extraction, large wastages without actually understanding how we could manage it sustainably. Um, so uh, the Niti Aayog had said that by 2020, both Delhi, Bangalore uh, and all some of the other major cities in the country were going to run out of groundwater. Fortunately, we have not. So what really has changed? Like I spoke about open wells, if they were there, why don't they have water anymore? What is it that we can do and how as all of you as students or as just citizens of the country, what are some of the simple and complex ways in which we can come together to manage groundwater sustainably in our country? So if you were to look at it and I'm taking the example of Bangalore and I know that this applies to most of the cities in the country. These are standard images. The image on top is that of pipes that are bringing water from really far away. And that's how water is coming into most of our cities with a lot of energy costs. And um, uh, so the water is moving in from a river or a reservoir far away and coming into our city. At the same time, in the peripheries of the city and even in core parts of the city, there is intense water scarcity. You have people queuing up for water and every time it rains, we have floods as well. That's also a common sight across most cities. At the same time, this was how a lot of our cities and villages have been where there have been traditional open wells, wells that have been a source of water that have been managed by the people and the community uh, for different purposes. And why did this happen is because several years ago, before a lot of concretization happened, most of the ground had soil, had trees, which were able to absorb the rainwater that fell and actually push it into the ground. What happens over a period of time as the city grows is that there is a lot of crusting that happens. As the city crusts up, rainwater that falls from on top is not able to percolate into the ground as easily as, as it used to before. So what happens as a result of this is that since it's not percolated, so this image we often bring up, it's almost a 
paradox that it's raining and still we need a tanker to be bringing in water for us. Uh, what, what are the problems we see in a city? Like I mentioned, on one hand, there's water scarcity. On one hand, there is urban flooding. And what has caused this? Uh, like was said earlier, it's because what has happened is that earlier when we had soil and um, a lot of greenery available, water could percolate into the ground and the flows that you see as interflow and base flow, this is the flow of water below the ground. And what is surface runoff is the runoff that happens from on top of the ground. As we build, the change that has happened is that there is a lot more surface runoff now that leads to flooding and the runoff that happens below the ground has significantly reduced. And that's why groundwater is growing, going deeper, is not available to us as easily. And, to, and so what are we doing now that we have crusted up and the groundwater is not available to us as easily? We are digging bore wells that are going deep into the ground to extract the same water. So it's really a challenge as you can see. The ground has crusted up, water is not percolating in, the water levels are falling deeper. Now instead of bringing that water level up, we are going to a level of extraction where we are digging bore wells deeper and deeper that are able to extract more and more water. At the same time, we are forgetting our wells. We are uh, filling it with garbage. So in terms of the solutions that we could adopt, we are looking at a more extractive solution where we are looking for sources of water either further away from rivers that are further and further away or from deeper and deeper below. And uh, uh, examples is we've been to reiterate these points. We've been dependent on the shallow aquifer. We've forgotten about it. We filled our wells, treating them as dustbins and we are going deeper and deeper down to get water. And at the same time, if you look at the country at large, what you see is that it's a country that receive most parts of the country receive reasonable amounts of rainfall, with some parts receiving very heavy rainfall. But largely in most parts of the country, you're receiving 700 to 800 millimeters of rainfall uh, across the year. Of course, the pattern of rain is different in, in, in different places, but there is a significant amount of rain that the country receives at an average. And at the same time, when we look at the soil below, which is an important part for us to manage groundwater, what we see is, especially in the Deccan, uh, the, the recharge that happens. So from ground to 10 feet is what is called the topsoil. A lot of water that percolates to these depths is not really available to us as groundwater, but is often lost to evapotranspiration. So that water does not contribute to groundwater. And if we want to recharge really and put water into the ground, we have to recharge at depths of 20 to 30 feet below ground level. And that's when the water tables actually rise. Um, so this is what has happened. We have extracted from what is called the shallow aquifer. The grayer part that you see is the shallow aquifer. The thinner bore well is actually extracting from the deeper aquifer. That's the bore well. And as we have extracted water, we've obviously dried up the aquifers. And if you really look at the numbers for our city, say on an area of about 1000 square kilometers, on a daily basis, we need about 1500 million liters per day. But if you look at the water that we get as rainfall, we are getting close to 3000 million liters per day equivalent. That means as rain, the water that falls on us is equivalent to twice the water that we require on a daily basis. So all that we need to do is really very simple dig recharge wells, allow for that water to go into the ground. That water as it goes into the ground, slowly percolates the aquifers, saturates the shallow aquifers, saturates the deep aquifer, and then water starts to be available for us yet again. This is how these wells are dug. They are called recharge wells. You dig, start by digging a hole into the ground. These are manually dug and we'll also come into it about manual or automatic. How would you want to do it a certain kind of way and why? So the well is a deep hole that goes into the ground. Rings are placed to provide structural stability to the well. And then the well is closed from on top with a grill or a slab so that nobody can accidentally fall in. And water that runs off, these are wells in parks, is redirected into this wells for groundwater recharge. So the water goes into the well, percolates out from the bottom of the well and recharges groundwater. These are all images to show you how it has been done in several residential areas uh, in parks and layouts. 
So these can be very easily implemented. We all have to go out and seek opportunities in parks, in uh, common areas, roads, in our individual houses, apartments, layouts, college campuses, wherever we stay. These wells can be dug any place. These are wells right below the Bangalore Metro on MG Road, which is a uh, principal main road of the city. Uh, you can also pick old wells, old wells, exist across the city would be surprised to see there are wells uh, since we're speaking of Koramangla at the police station at the park at the BDA complex in various very local locations wells are available we can either clean it up use it as a source of water if it's not available as a source of water and there's no water in it it can be used for groundwater recharge here is an example of a residential community that revived its well and actually the, I shall show subsequent pictures where that well was filled up and became a source of water. This is in an individual home. This gentleman doesn't take any water from any municipal water source, but relies on groundwater alone as a source of water. He recharges his well with rooftop rainwater. The well then is full of water. He's able to pump and use this water all through the year. Uh, a gated community on a road called Sarjapura Road, which is a dry area where water runs, uh, groundwater is very deep. What they did over a period of time was they dug over 250 wells on 36 acres of land to recharge uh, the ground. And what happened as a result of that, so multiple things, they also banned private bore wells, uh, the recharge wells decreased their flooding. And now with 260 recharge wells on their campus, what has happened over a period of time is that where 10 years ago they were not getting water at 1000 feet below ground level. Now at 360 feet below ground level, they're able to get over 1 lakh liters every day of the year. And all of this has happened with groundwater recharge and also, of course, a lot of conversation around water conservation, about paying the true price of water. And hence communication is a very large part of making sure that uh, Com uh, communication, awareness events, people actually demonstrating ways by which groundwater tables actually rise. So this we put it in the form of a comic book, but it's actually a real community where water, the water tables have been revived for about 400 odd homes. And so it makes for a great story. Again, this an old open well. Uh, looking at the picture, normally we say it's a fun exercise. Estimate what is the diameter or the depth of the well, given the people who are there in the image. When that well was cleaned up and revived, this is the well when it is full. Uh, and you can see how the water tables have risen. We also have images where the pipe that you see on the image, that's also submerged. And what then happens is that this well becomes a source of water. Starting from being a recharge structure, it then is a clean source of water. A few other examples. This is a school, government school adjacent to a lake, had no water. Uh, they were digging bore wells, buying tanker water. Subsequently, what they did was rainwater harvesting. Rooftop rainwater was directed into a recharge well. That well also became a source of water, and now it is the source of water for the school. So despite being close to a lake, they, they were not getting water from deep bore wells, but with shallow recharge with rainwater uh, and extracting water from the shallow aquifer, they've actually found a source of water, which kind of brings me to the larger campaign that we are running for this city. It's called A Million Wells for Bangalore. Uh, uh, the idea based on the capacity, the kind of rainfall we get, we think we need about a million wells uh, in the city. And uh, this is an attempt to map those wells on a map. And how do you go about doing this? And this is where students can be very helpful. There are very ways we participate because we need to go out and talk to as many people as possible. We have to document the wells that have already been done, which are success stories. We have to talk about it more. Uh, it could be on social media. It could be on print. Uh, there have to be demonstration projects. So if you see, there are about 240 wards in the city. So we need at least two or five demonstration wards. People take ownership of separate wards where they live and see how we can demonstrate water management practices. We also need to be talking to the government and it's surprising when students, citizens come together, work on a particular idea, are able to demonstrate their idea. Even government institutions are very willing to step forward and contribute in various ways to 
make sure that this happens. And like I spoke about initially, when we speak of water and we think of plants and birds and flora and fauna, we also have to keep in mind that a lot of this has to happen with some kind of social inclusion as well. So there is a traditional community called the Bovi community. They are traditional well diggers who had often gone out of occupation because people weren't digging wells anymore. So the way we have structured this campaign is to include them as partners, partners not only for digging the wells, but also partners who are then able to go out and speak to a larger audience about the need for groundwater recharge, the existence of the shallow aquifer and how it can be better managed. In fact, if you take a if you look at it scientifically, if you want to map the city's aquifers, the well diggers, because of their knowledge of having worked in specific localities, are able to give us a lot of information about the presence of water and given students of botany, the linkages between different types of plants and water that they have observed on site, which were then able to take back to academic institutions who are then able to work with this data to actually create a aquifer map. So it's really about the coming together. In this image, we actually have people from the BWSSB, from our organization, Biome, from the Srishti School of Art and Design, who helped create a lot of visuals at the Kaban Park metro station around water, the well diggers. So groundwater, because it is invisible, flows beneath all of us, is available to all of us. So it's really about all of us coming together and driving that agenda together. It could be now we even have the well diggers on social media where they're able to talk about it. We ourselves run a page called a million wells for Bangalore. So largely coming to the point that to manage groundwater, uh, we need everybody comes together, come together. It takes the entire village, so to say. We need the scientists, we need the academic institutions, we need the well diggers, we need children, housewives, uh, everybody. And a lot of information about what I spoke today is available on a site that we run for the city. It's called bengaluru.urbanwaters.in. There is an attempt to add. We have added Tumkur as a city. We are going to be adding several more cities as we go along. Pune, Hyderabad, Chennai are in the pipeline. It really tells you about the state of water in your city, what you can do as an individual, and who are the people that you can reach out to to do this. And we are also in the process of documenting a lot, a lot of case studies. Our imagination as an organization of groundwater is something like this, where it's available at shallow depths, available for all, available as a drinking water source, also available for leisure and recreation. Where we also feel brave to swim in a well like this and not just a swimming, swimming pool where we feel a lot more comfortable. So thank you very much. With that, I come to the end of this presentation. So water sufficiency is about resilience, a million wells, including the well diggers for Bangalore. And though I'm saying Bangalore, the campaign is actually uh, for all the other cities as well. And that's been kind of carried forward by the Jaljeevan mission, uh, which is looking at setting up these kind of water parks, information centers, groups across the country who can speak not only about groundwater, but about various sustainable ways of managing water. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that excellent presentation. Now, this is the interactive session for the participants. Dear participants, all the questions, please type in the chat box with your name and organization name. I will ask on behalf of you with our speaker. Let us begin our session, ma'am. Question for you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. If you can just read out the question, I'll respond. I'm not able to see the question, so. Okay. Uh, my name is Shivashi Minati. His question is: Are there any purifiers or filters currently applying for removing microplastics from drinking water? Yeah, OK, that's a deeply technical question. Yes, uh, microplastics are, uh, uh, are a significant problem. I'm not sure if the, the RO filters, the reverse osmosis filters, say that they can remove all the chemical dissolved pollutants in the water. But I think microplastics are what are being described as an emerging field of contaminants. 
and it still has to be studied and understood. But yes, for drinking water, there are systems, purification systems that can remove microplastics from drinking water. But as it exists in nature, let's say microplastics that you're now finding in the oceans and in the rivers, what are systems at scale that can be used to remove microplastics? Uh, the problem still remains. That's at one level. And then the larger problem of how these microplastics are going into these water bodies in the first place and what is it that we can do? So we have to address this problem from both its ends uh, in the existing water bodies. How do you identify and remove microplastics? So to answer your question, at a drinking water scale, at a small scale, most contaminants, there are now systems in place that can even treat wastewater to drinking water standards. So that way we are good, but uh, in, in the environment, in the ecosystem as it exists, how do you remove microplastics? How do you keep them from entering the system in the first place? And so then how do we look at our consumption and our systems for waste disposal? All of that comes into question. Thanks. That was a very interesting uh, question. Yeah. Thank you. Keep asking the same question. What, uh, what, what, what the cost of making this re recharge wells for one one community or one area, a cost of one well? Oh, very nice. That's a very good question. So uh, I will respond to that. Now the wells. Uh, are, can be of various sizes. Normally what we do in the city, they're about three feet in diameter, 20 to 25 feet deep. The activities that are involved, like I showed, was the digging, the placing of the rings. So somebody has to source the rings from somewhere, place it. Then there is a kind of jelly filling that has to happen in the space around the rings. Then the well has to be covered from on top with a slab. Sometimes we put another grill so that nobody accidentally or willfully is able to fall into the well. And there is some other civil work that may have to be constructed because in a city, let's say I'm, I have a house on a 30, 40 plot and I'm building a well there. Maybe I'm breaking up a little bit of my car parking area or uh, some kind of paved area. So I have to fill that up as well. And the soil that comes from a location has to be gone and dumped outside. So on an average, the cost of a well, including all or some of these activities, for a three feet diameter and 25 feet deep well is anywhere between 35 to 50,000 rupees. Yeah, and uh, more details about this in terms of sizes and costs is available in what we call there's a recharge well primer and an open well primer that is available on the site called bengaluru.urbanwaters.in. There we have given information on people you can contact uh, to get uh, to get these wells dug and information on costs and the activities that are involved in that. So yes, the small the smaller wells can be much cheaper, but on on an average for a house, we say that you need a three feet and twenty five feet deep well. The costs are between thirty five to fifty thousand rupees, which includes all of these activities. Yeah, so I'm done. Hello. Yes. What are the initiatives in our country for ecosystem sustainability? Currently, what are yeah, the yeah. So I should. Yes, yes, yeah. So there are uh, various steps that are being taken out. I shall just restrict it to water because then the next speaker can address it at large. So in terms of water sustainability, so if you look at our ecosystem and we can look at it in multiple ways, right? From an anthropocentric way, but I'm seeing about the water that I need and how do I make sure that the ecosystem is sustainable to be able to give me that source of water. And then the next is if you look at the area at large, for, for the other birds and bees and every everything else that exists on the planet. So at a city, at the country level, what is being run right now is, is the Jal Jeevan mission or the Jal Shakti Abhyan. So there the idea, of course, it's coming from a system of providing water to everybody. But the government also realizes that if I can't just say that I'm going to provide water to everybody if there is not enough water. So the, the activities that are taken up is first around water demand. So the thing is, know how much water you need, figure out if you're consuming OK or lesser and what are the opportunities to really keep your water demand low. Yeah, so that's step number one. Step number two is look for 
the sources of water and try. So water demand can be reduced either by metering, paying lesser for it, or just being conscious of the uh, quantity of water you're using and using lesser. The next is choosing the most sustainable source of water. And sustainability, we think, is probably the water that comes to you most locally. So from the most local river, stream, groundwater, rainwater. And then when you don't, so you make your choices correspondingly. So even at a city level, that's what we're telling the city. Use water that's coming at the lowest cost, most sustainability to you, to you first. And then when you're out of that water, go further and further away. Now what's happening is we look at the further away option because it's already in place as the primary source. And rainwater is then looked at as a supplemental source. So can we flip that around in our choices of water and how do we drive that decision making? Then what happens to our wastewater? That's also a large part of ecosystem sustainability because right now there, uh, I mean, wastewater is either treated or untreated, sent into water bodies. As you would have heard, the Belandur Lake that is a uh, few uh, catches fire or contaminants going in, which includes these microplastics, micronutrients as well. But at the same time, there is a kind of reuse of wastewater that's happening for agriculture or treated wastewater that's used to fill lakes and hence recharging groundwater. So the third step that the government is taking right now, especially at this Karnataka level, is looking at wastewater, encouraging ways to make sure that wastewater is treated and reused as locally as possible. And in cases where local reuse is not possible, the scheme that has been undertaken is to pump, treat this water and pump it to fill the lakes in the drought prone districts, which are on the peripheries of the city. And from where and what has been observed is actually about 124 such lakes have been filled up. In turn, that is bringing about a lot of flora and fauna that was not there at those water bodies so far. Of course, we have to be watchful and see what happens as a result of this. How do we make sure that water quality uh, is not affected as a result of this. But yes, the solutions are around wastewater. So simply put, we have to manage our water demand. Steps are being taken at individual and centralized levels to curtail water demand. Policy has been set in place in our city that every house has to be metered, has to pay for the water it uses. We have to pick a source of water that's most sustainable, most local. We have to make sure that wastewater, we, we take responsibility for our wastewater as well. The wastewater that comes out of our house to the extent possible is treated and reused within the house itself or else it is sent out to a community level for treatment and reuse. And in the case that all of this is not possible, that's when it goes out to a city level where the city then manages the wastewater for us. And that in turn, and when you look outside of, uh, like I said, the anthropocentric view, it's about the water bodies. The I mean, there are several examples I can give for around our city itself. How do we manage the water bodies? How can lakes be rejuvenated? How do we do it in a most participatory way where we are involving all stakeholders, be they fishermen, cattle herders, um, gardeners, well diggers? And with all of them in place, how do we manage our water bodies better? So those really are the steps that we can take. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, very important question. It's a regarding regarding the cost of well. The details yeah. from the college is asking the question: What is the cost for single recharge well? Yeah. yeah. So, like I mentioned, a single recharge well which is three feet in diameter. This is in Bangalore in, and it varies as because it's dependent on the material, on the availability of labor, the kind of soil. So there are a lot of uh, on ground realities that have to be considered. But on an average, the cost for digging a well, a recharge well with the structures that I mentioned about the slab and the grill and the dumping of the soil costs anywhere between 35,000 to 50,000 rupees. And when many are dug together, the costs are lower. Uh, when it's dug at a smaller scale with a smaller diameter, it, it the small the starting price can even be as low as fifteen thousand rupees, where you shrink the size. So it's dependent on all of that. And do take a look at that site, urbanwaters.in. A lot of this information is available on the site because when you have a ten feet diameter well or some of the other wells that I showed you in the images, how much do they cost? That kind of detailed information is available on that urbanwaters.in. Question when this one person is Gitesh Kumar is asking, is should the government make the groundwater recharge mandatory? Oh, yes, yes. And the government, they should make it mandatory. They have made it mandatory also. 
but still like with many things that are mandatory it is for self assessment and self deployment so they do uh, in the city so actually right now across the country rainwater harvesting is mandatory in most towns villages uh, in bangalore and our city it it has been described to a greater level of detail they have given description saying for every square meter of rooftop you need to do 30 liters of storage every square meter of non rooftop you need to do 20 liters of recharge there are a lot of descriptions that have given which which make it much easier for us to adhere to the law so simple answer to your question yes it's mandatory uh the complex answer to your question it's mandatory but still not everybody follows why don't they follow sometimes it is cost sometimes it's some practical constraints sometimes it's just lack of knowledge that it is mandatory in the first place so which is why we awareness the need to demonstrate the need to talk about it more and more and many times people also just dig something which is just serves the purpose of the mandatoriness it's like if 40% is pass marks or many times we just do something that's enough to meet that criteria but we really have to look at the purpose that it serves so many times we've seen people who say a recharge well they'll call it a recharge well but it may have just been a small 2 feet deep pit that they've dug and they say the water percolates from here but what you realize is that structure is not sufficient does not percolate does not contribute to groundwater and uh, so which is why in karnataka in bangalore specifically that has been made more specific you have to dig 20 feet deep a lot of criteria have been given so that this can be adhered to appropriately yes thank you thank you very much ma'am with this last question now we are winding up the interactive session uh, thank you very much ma'am for that excellent presentation and the very interactive session i just thank you so much and thank you, thank you so, so much for the principal dr sister lalita thomas on behalf of the department of botany we are very much enlightened with the information on million recharge wells for bangalore now we have with us our guest speaker mr samir sisodia ceo grand matter foundation mr samir heads the grand matter foundation developing projects in building funding and investment programs among many other things he left his long career in the tech industry a decade ago and partly moved to pool to experiment with sustainable farming farm collecting and his personal passion rejuvenating soil and forests he runs linger as a hobby and shares his thoughts regularly on his blog he also co-founded the farming collective as well as be forest he is a strong believer in natural farming as a major way to fix our ecology and live sustainably a very warm welcome to you sir your presence is indeed a source of great motivation we are very much delighted to have you as guest speaker for our webinar over to you sir hi uh, good afternoon everybody um delighted to be here um it's a uh, it's always a uh, nice talking to uh, folks who represent the coming generations and uh, hope ahead so thank you for that so uh, i'm samir and i um, i represent i i run the rain matter foundation uh, which was started by zerodha which is uh, india's largest stock broking uh, platform uh, this happened around uh, last Uh, end of last year, uh, the team at Zerotha, me personally, and a lot of people who are involved in this are uh, we are we are seriously concerned about uh, the direction in which our uh, eco ecology is headed, uh, the changes we are seeing from uh, um, you know in the in the climate and and the disasters that are unfolding in front of us across the world right now. Um, so we decided to do something about it. So. Um, this is this is something we realized very very quickly i mean now now it's becoming more and more evident every passing week practically there's there's a there's a new disaster reported from a different part of the world uh, the wildfires across the world now uh, in australia the uh, across siberia we've seen them in canada in the us west uh, northwest and so on and so forth um there's uh, there's been flooding in germany and india we've seen a series of these events uh, china has been 
having continuous flooding and uh, excessive rainfall events over the last few. And all of this has happened like in the last few months itself. Um, the frequency of these events, every every event is a is a new hundred year record, and and um, in within a few months that record is broken. So according to a lot of estimates, uh, according to the IPCC report that came out a few days ago, uh, we don't have that much time to fix this. Um, all all that we have constructed in terms of our economy, in terms of our society, um, over practically over thousands of years is at risk if you do not understand then this problem address it uh, really really quickly so in our in our small way we are trying to uh, do something about this i will I'll talk a little more about that um so it's already a worldwide problem there are a whole bunch of tipping points um this was this was a figure that was uh, predicted to be in the future about what tipping points we would reach with temperature rains. But I think a lot of these tipping points are already here. We are already at a very erratic monsoon in the, uh, in the country. There's been wildfires uh, in the in, in Canada, in the north northwest of the US. Uh, there's, uh, you know, Australia has had a whole series of problems. Um, the ice sheets are already below um, any any hope of revival now. So I think I think the next big focus is one is if there is any hope left of slowing this down, how do we do this? And at the very least, how do we adapt to this? How do we live better on this planet, right? So so that brings us to the question of what. What are we trying to do? You, you'd have heard of this uh, joke that goes around a lot saying, uh, you know, don't worry about the planet, it'll take care of itself. And that's really, really true. So um, in, in an interactive session, of course, I would I would let people answer this question to their uh, best imagination possible. Um, here, I'll just, I'll just jump to the usual answer I give. We are we're basically trying to live better on this planet, live in a way that's uh, viable for us as a species, right? Uh, why we are why we are worried about this problem is because it is now starting to become apparent that it threatens our own existence itself, right? Definitely, it uh, threatens our uh, continued uh, uh, existence as we know it in terms of how we use the resources, how we uh, you know the, the benefits of the planet that we enjoy. It, it's definitely threatening that. Um, nothing is stable anymore. Temperatures are up. Uh, Water is drying up, as you heard from Shubha. Uh, so it's really that we are trying to make the planet more livable for ourselves. And when when we speak of the planet, it's it's every square kilometer of it. It's every park. It's every city. It's every town, village, um, every mountain range, every lake out there. You know, so so it's not this abstract entity. So then we we, we started looking at the problem from uh, you know various uh, aspects of it, and and we realized that uh, for any place to be called livable from a human point of view, from a human perspective, you could, because you cannot solve this problem because without solving the human problems, right? Because uh, we we are the ones, we, we our aspirations, our activity, uh, are the are the things that have led up to this problem. Right, so we have to address those as well. So you need a baseline ecology uh, at a certain health in every place that human beings consider livable. If if Bangalore runs out of water, software will not exist here. Right, if if uh, Bombay starts to get uh, more and more flooded, the financial industry there will collapse and move elsewhere. If if a village runs out of water or uh, good soil. Uh, it ceases to exist. People migrate out. If if Delhi's air becomes any worse, and I already have a bunch of friends who have moved out of Delhi because their kids are asthmatic and the doctors have advised them to not live in the city anymore. Um, if it gets any worse, uh, people will abandon the city at, at, at a very large scale. And when you start looking at this at a planetary scale, where will we go? Elon Musk is trying to uh, send us all to Mars, but that's that's a pipe dream. I don't think I don't think that's possible. We have a planet here and a lot of systems here that have worked for us that we have evolved from and our best 
bet is to start taking care of those systems. Then you have, of course, the human services, uh, the what what we roll into the HDI uh, around education, healthcare, and so on and so forth. You have the economic layer where we uh, care about creating businesses, uh, creating products, uh, our entrepreneurship livelihoods, our jobs. And of course, you have a very uh, important layer of our uh, rootedness to our places, uh, what we sometimes call indigenous, what we sometimes call the, our cultural uh, connectedness to a place. Because that very often binds us to all of this. So for any place to be livable, all of this has to be healthy. And the way we've been solving problems as governments, as individuals, as, uh, as uh, uh, market forces, as NGOs, is in one of these silos or the other. Right? We, we solve for the economy, but we neglect the ecology. And the ecology usually gets neglected by anybody solving any other problem. We, we assume that the ecology already exists. Right, we, have, we are trying to double farmers incomes, but if you double farmers incomes without accounting for the ecology, you may you may do it for four or five or seven years, but then the village will run out of any soil uh, health um, that can sustain agriculture, any amount of water that can sustain human life over there. So you have to account for multiple of these uh, pillars. You have to account for the ecology in any any problem that you solve. And this is something we are trying to actually get across to everybody out there trying to solve these problems. Um, another thing we realize very quickly is that we look at conservation, we look at afforestation and all that in a little silo. We assume that we can do it there and ignore the rest of it. And that's how we've been behaving for hundreds of years now. Right? Uh, forest cover in India, if you ask some experts, is about 5%. Add another percentage or 2% at the edges of the forest. Uh, where some afforestation efforts, creation of corridors are uh, underway. 95% of the landscape is where we do other stuff, right? We do agriculture, we run industry, we create highways, roads, our malls, uh, houses, and so on and so forth. What we do in this 95% is, is extremely important to this problem. We are not going to solve this problem by doing 5% and even if we extend that 5% to 10%, we haven't really made a dent in the problem. If the 90% continues to degrade every resource that we depend on at the rate we are doing right now. Right? And so this is this is something important to understand because it it we tend to think of climate as a conservation problem, as a, as a problem of carbon, as a problem of uh, temperature. But it's actually a problem of every human activity and how we how we operate and live on this planet. So it's it's not it's not something that a few people will do in some specific contexts. Uh, we are also taking this approach that we need to enable people because this has to be adopted by everybody, right? Unless unless the village believes that its future lies in a better ecology around it, in in the growth of the forest around it, in the in the uh, quality and the quantity of the groundwater that gets replenished every year, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are not going to we are not going to uh, win this battle by just because there's government policy or just because an NGO is working on it or just because there's a technical solution. You know, everybody needs to believe that our uh, our future, our our well-being uh, is linked deeply to the natural world around us. Until we believe that. I think we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll do piecemeal solutions to these problems, but we'll find them appearing elsewhere. And uh, you know, right now, if you go back to this, they're appearing across the world. And uh, I don't think we need more evidence. We don't need a Hollywood Hollywood movie to paint a scary picture for us anymore. Uh, a quick read of the newspaper every week is enough. Um, it will need a lot of collaboration because uh, you know, right now. Uh, like I said, people work in silos. People solve either healthcare or uh, uh, watersheds or agriculture, or somebody's uh, trying to solve renewable energy and so on and so forth. But we just just have to deepen the network of how we work on this planet, which means it has to be connected to entrepreneurship, to the societies where this uh, uh, change happens, to people trying to uh, grow food, trying to transport that food, the consumers themselves. So we need a lot of exchanging of ideas. We need so this is this is something we are actively working on. How do you get collaboration 
across uh, problem solving uh, NGOs, governments, um, individuals, uh, market forces and so on and so forth. Um, and how do you actually make a lot of the good ideas very easily available to everybody so that, you know, just just like uh, across Bangalore, you see uh, Udupi restaurants which uh, look alike, which serve similar food, but they're not owned by the same person, but they just, you know, quickly copy the ideas. So we need we need a lot of people working on these ideas quickly, copying ideas from each other, adapting it locally and so on and so forth. So uh, the way, way we put it is we actually need successful forests. The success of an individual tree is not the important one, but the forest needs to grow really fast. Um, messaging is a very, very important part of it because unless the ideas behind this change, they become mainstream and they, they relate to what we do in our daily lives, the numbers we care about, the outcomes we care about. Today, um, academics, wildlifers, uh, researchers, they talk about a bunch of numbers, they talk about a bunch of concepts that don't necessarily relate to the things you and I care about in our daily lives, right? Like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm assuming most students here are looking at uh, some sort of a job or, or, or a career in one of the six or seven cities across the country, right? Now imagine the lakhs and lakhs and lakhs of you know uh, people your age who are actually ready to step into uh, you know uh, work life. Is it is it a healthy country and a and a healthy place uh, uh, to be in where we have restricted those options to just six cities, maybe ten or twelve thousand square kilometers in a country this large, right? It goes back to how many places are livable. Where do you have decent economy, where do you have decent ecology, uh, you know, decent level of human services and so on and so forth. So as we care about what people care about, as we translate uh, the, you know, soil health becomes your natural world, becomes your health, becomes your healthcare cost as well. You know, if you, if you, if you eat better, grow better and eat better today, you're saving lakhs in healthcare subsequently as, as, as a population. So how do we understand these numbers better? This is, I think, I think the messaging, the storytelling around this is a very, very, very critical piece. Uh, this is this is an R&D problem because, um, you know, all of our economy is contained inside society and at, at the base, at the foundational level is the ecology that supports it all. But today through carbon taxes and other, other mechanisms, what we're doing is we're taking the economy, trying to take a little percentage of it and representing all of the ecology in it. We cannot have this relationship. This is a very unhealthy relationship. When people talk about a balance between uh, environment and the economy, the balance is far gone. You know, we are we are at a place where the uh, environment has and the ecology has suffered to like a huge degree, and uh, every decision is primarily an economic decision. Right? So we have to start thinking of how do we reverse this? How do we get people to recognize that this is a broken? system right now. Um, a lot of uh, you you read a lot about what you can do individually and those actions are important right each time each time you choose to walk or cycle or or take a smaller vehicle instead of a bigger vehicle or public transport you are actually helping towards this each time you carry your own bag and not not use plastic you are helping with the with the problem uh, reducing each time you actually buy local and seasonal vegetables, you are helping with it. So individual action does add up to the entire planet eventually. But there's also this large matrix around you, right? Uh, this this web of interconnected uh, forces from the government, from the market, from, uh, the way logistics works. Uh, I mean, you may have a strong desire to eat local, but if nobody around you is selling local produce, you'll be unable to do that. Right. If the messaging around you is continuously about uh, a need that will be fulfilled from across three continents, you will be forced to consider that. Right. So uh, if you if you have to go, if I have to go meet somebody in Delhi today, I have to take a flight. I don't have an option. So uh, at an individual level, we will continue to exist in this. What we can start doing is at an individual level or in every piece of work that we do or decision that we make or uh, organizations that we run, how do we change small edges in this network? 
and and the more of us that do that and the faster we do that you know the network will start changing and that, that that's the right way to look at it because this this debate about oh but uh, you know the, you 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 hear about uh, all the folks flying into the uh, climate conferences uh, and and people uh, passing snide remarks about that but what are they to do if if people have to reach uh, paris for a, uh, a climate conference and have some agreement the tool that the world has produced in the past is a flight is is a fuel guzzling flight and you don't have an option right now while we work on the options we have to use the tools of today every solar panel produced today has used coal in the background and that's the reality but i think i think how fast and in how many small instances are we able to start doing these changes right at every level right from from the individual to government policy that will determine whether we are able to uh, make use of these ten years sensibly or completely give up after that so yeah what can you do uh, individually uh, in your organizations so one is to just understand this problem and believe uh, you know at 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 a at a connect to the problem at an emotional level because that's finally we when we start to make decisions if you if you do not uh, if you just hear of a report of wildfire somewhere somewhere in our head there's a there's a voice telling us that it won't happen to me you know when when there's flooding around you when there's uh, um, crop losses around you when there's uh, droughts around you uh, we still refuse to believe that it'll somehow affect us especially in our cities because we've constructed these long supply chains and we've you know uh, flooding flooding in a place 100 kilometers away doesn't affect us immediately but we are just buying time through this right it's 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 uh, if the if the food supplies run out like bangalore typically has about 3 days of most supplies and if the supply chains crack for whatever reason as did happen a little bit during the pandemic etc those uh, supply chains get strained very very quickly the second thing is to actually not just act individually but make it a larger uh, movement if you will i mean everybody around us has to start believing that we need to act towards resolving this towards solving this problem so you have to be visible you have to be vocal about it uh, the one big problem today is that we don't have collective goals right if we if we chase goals on this we are looking at electric vehicles which are looking at uh, you know small uh, small adjustments and small uh, tinkering at the edges but we can't really do that we have to strike at the the roots of these problems right uh, your food traveling food that is produced everywhere stuff like millets and rice traveling across the country you know you you getting stuff that is produced uh, 50 kilometers away from 1000 kilometers away because it's cheaper right these are these are these are th things that we have to reverse how do we arrive at goals even if um, as consumers as uh, as professionals as as people running industries uh, there's a perceived loss and a perceived pain right now because the perceived the the real loss coming from how this is changing is massive those those uh, products those uh, industries will cease to exist in 10 years time and i i don't don't say this lightly the way the rate at which it is adding up uh, you know everything where that we take for granted today will not exist in a decade or two decades it's we are not we are not counting in hundreds of years anymore right things are changing quite dramatically so we can we can make this uh, start making these changes like i said you know whatever part of the network you are in right as an individual as an organization as an entrepreneur as as a government uh, uh, employee or or um, as a politician you can actually start making little changes right there uh some things that we need to do is learn and copy with pride from other good examples out there i think there are many good examples but they are all in little pilot projects one example here one instance there and we we clap and we take uh, photographs and we you know kind of move it into the back burner continue with our lives so we have to bring all this to the mainstream we have to copy the good examples at a furious pace we have to adopt them we have to adapt them locally and uh, you know hopefully the network will start to change at a very very rapid pace
um, yeah, so this is everybody's problem, uh, irrespective of whatever you do. Uh, I'm at this mail ID if anybody uh, needs to reach out. We are trying to support uh, uh, folks doing wildlife conservation, folks, folks doing uh, uh, water management at scale. Agriculture, especially dry land agriculture in India is a very, very low space. Um, you know, we have desertified large tracts of land. Uh, soil carbon across the Deccan Plateau is at 0.3% or lower when it needs to be 3% or higher. So obviously it doesn't sustain life and it doesn't doesn't produce enough food. So you need to get into the whole uh, chem chemical cycle. Uh, we're trying to uh, see how we can influence policy on this. And we're also trying to see how all of these folks can collaborate. And uh, how, how these ideas, how the changes can get adopted by the villages, adopted by the the populations who will benefit from it most uh, in a in a longer term time frame, right? Whether through market mechanisms or through government mechanisms, that that's not the point. But they have to be adopted by uh, the people. You you can't just have a top down approach to problem solving anymore because that that doesn't sustain. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, open to questions on this. Hello. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for an outstanding and insightful presentation. Now, we are participants. We are open for the questions. Please write your question in the chat box, and I will read on behalf of you and the last speaker. One important question, sir. Shall we begin? Yes, please. One question that uh, water scarcity is also a problem in some areas Bangalore. Yes. So what are the solutions if the oil crop rainwater harvesting? But so Yeah, so what are the, what, I'll just repeat the question. What are the solutions to uh, water scarcity? Water, rainwater harvesting, what are the other solutions? Uh, so rainwater harvesting is a, uh, uh, it's a downstream fix. You know, when you when you already arrived at a problem, the problem in is uh, problem is in uh, one is in at the, at the consumption level. How much water are we using? Uh, water is something that can be reused. It's finally the same amount of water on the planet. Um, that has existed for thousands of years, like forever practically, right? Um, um, so how we use the water, how we discharge it, what is the second use of water, third use of water, fourth use of water before you discharge it? How much aligned are you with the water cycle, right? So uh, nature works in circular loops. We work linearly. We, we think of clean water and then we think of dirty water. Right, but it's the same water that's going to come to you later, and that's going to come to your kids and grandkids and seven generations down the line. Right, so so if you if you make sure the the linear bit that we are involved in is healthy and discharges water of the same grade that comes into our system, right, that's that's a huge uh, up change in approach. I right? do not do not think of dirty water as a separate thing and clean water as a separate thing that somebody else has to deal with. Uh, the second is uh, the levels of consumption itself, efficiency, right? As uh, we 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 assume that uh, piped water is necessary, we assume you know how do how do you even question your assumptions today? Like nowhere outside the cities do you behave the same way across seasons. If you are in Rajasthan in the dry season, you actually use much less of water, whether it's for uh, personal use or for um, you know. For your farming activities and so on and so forth. Today, if you actually manage to sink a bow well, you start to do paddy, irrespective of where you are in the country. Right? Such habits have set in both in the urban context and in the rural context. Like we do not actually need to, uh, you know, wash our cars and wash our streets and wash our lawns. You know, we don't, we we don't need to have lawns in the city. So how we how we design how we operate uh, in any landscape is of prime importance. Then there's fundamentals that if you have a lot of green cover, biodiversity, if you have healthy soil, 
population is healthier. I mean, uh, a very healthy soil is 25% water, right? So overall, whatever you see in the lakes and tanks and rivers is a very, very, very tiny percentage of all the water that's available. Right? We've all learned in sixth and seventh standard geography that uh, springs are born from the forests which release water slowly. We have to believe that fact that, you know, uh, the, the catchment area of the Kaveri holds enough water in the soil and slowly releases it to actually give birth to a major river. Right? It's, it's amazing how people are surprised by how a spring is born when they see it, despite having all the information and knowledge that we have. Right? So uh, thinking of the entire landscape as a water tank, how do you get the soils to be healthy? How do you get the catchments to be cleared? Right? I think uh, Bangalore, for instance, is blessed with adequate amount of rainfall. If you just use it right, if you use it efficiently, and uh, if you don't put our expectations of having fountains and excessive, you know, we've, we've also linked our prosperity to the amount of energy we spend today, right? And that shows up in water as well. So if we, if we question that, dealing that, I think we'll start to make progress. Now, one more question from our student, Sagya Singh. She is asking what type of house we should build that can accommodate the rainwater harvesting system easily. Um, you can do this in any type of house. Uh, rainwater harvesting is possible wherever you have. Uh, uh, you know, it, it finally boils down to uh, what's falling on your piece of land. So. You can you can harvest water on the uh, terrace for your own consumption. Uh, Shubha's the expert. I'm not an expert on that, so uh, I will only be able to give you what I've overheard from her. Uh, but you can also harvest the water that falls on the land. Uh, basically, ensure that it doesn't run off and it goes into the soil as much as possible. Um, in, in depending on where you are, and we've seen this in farms, you also sometimes get the uh, runoff from. Um, landscapes that are higher to yours, right? Uh, so you are downstream from, let's say, 20 acres of land. You will actually get a runoff from a lot of it. So you need to harvest that as well. Um, yeah, so less less constructed spaces, uh, more green spaces, more natural, healthy soil, uh, whatever, whatever harvesting you can do. But actually, let me, let me uh, segue into a linked question on this. What house should you build? Right, it's not not just from a water perspective, but uh, materials that are local, replenishable. Um, you know, housing is actually like a huge, huge, huge generator of uh, 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 you know, con consumer of materials and generator of emissions. So, if you are able to uh, create your house from, let's say, bamboo. Bamboo is a completely replenishable class. It's weather friendly. It's uh, it's completely biodegradable. Uh, so we need to we need to push our R and D and we need to push our efforts into these directions. Thank you, sir. Uh, one one question is Ramana C. Party, RLS College, Belagavi. Her question mm -hmm. is: How climate change is affecting flora and fauna? Um, at a massive scale, because uh, every species has a uh, operating temperature and. Uh, it's very sensitive to like many, many of the even the food crops that we grow uh, have a 50 percent reduction for uh, three or four degrees increase in the winter temperature or reduction in the summer temperature. So uh, we see this out there uh, in the fields all the time. Um, it's happening to uh, um, you know, the wild as well. By some estimates, um, at least in some parts of the year, you lose about a hundred species. Hundred species a day get extinct. That's the rate at which we are losing uh, biodiversity. Right? Uh, it's a it's a massive loss because we don't even understand the functions that these species are playing. Right? Like nature, nature is all interconnected loops. So a lot of these loops are getting disrupted permanently at a at a rate which has never happened before. One very scary outcome I was reading from this is if uh, the fungi uh, have existed uh, billions of years before any other uh, life on the on the land uh, 
uh, on the planet Chota, right? Before plants and animals came to be for 80 million years, years ago, fungi were had been around for over a couple of billion years. If the fungi get used to uh, the temperature range that mammals exist in, fungi operate at a much lower range. If uh, even a couple of dozen fungi out of the millions that exist get adapt to this temperature range because we are continuously heating the planet. Uh, I don't think we have answers to uh, fungal attacks at, at the scale we will see, right? It, it, that's, that's like a really, really worrisome phenomena if it, if it starts to happen like that. So the entire natural world is continuously adapting to change. Um, the biodiversity is shrinking. Uh, it will recover at some point. We may not be around. You know, our, our activity may be completely. Um, uh, it may come to a standstill because all that we depend on today is uh, rapidly reducing. The participant Dignesh S. Kumar is asking without political support, is it possible for us to involve, engage, and change the climate in various ways? So I think I think uh, this is a larger question, and what we have to ask ourselves is, um, you know, what is politics? Uh, politics doesn't survive without our implicit or explicit support. If if all of us want to move in a certain direction, politics will follow. Right. So socially, we have to arrive at some goals. We have to make sure, you know, to. Both, both politics, governance, and uh, the market look at us as individual consumers today. They are, they are in a, uh, I will fulfill your needs mode. And our, our framework of needs has continuously gone up, right? We demand more and more and more of not just the natural world, but also of our politics and of the market. Today, if you have to uh, use 30% lower, lesser water, right? Or 30% lesser energy, you think of it as a sacrifice. But if you think of it as a win, if you think of it as a win because you know what, the next generation will be alive because we did this, right? Then politics will follow. So I think politics is a following act. It's not a leading act. I, I, I don't think we use the word leader very often. I don't think there are leaders in politics, at least anymore. So, yeah. yeah thank you, sir. One more question. It's uh, apart from the government policies, lot of the things the common man or people do. So uh, apart from the government policies, what other activities we can do and we can get involved on them? So like I was saying, so we, we can focus on the small individual activities for sure on a daily basis, uh, but in a in a large network of pulls and pressures and messaging uh, and how our current uh, markets and supply chains exist. It's it's a it's a battle you have to fight. What you can do is wherever you are, whether in education, whether in uh, whether it's uh, industry or design or or you know grassroots work or agriculture, see how you can make a change. Uh, how how you can be nature positive on it. How you can work for the soil. I mean, if there's one focus area as a, as a consumer or as as industry or whatever how do how do you actually have a positive impact on the soil that you are dealing with directly or indirectly right which means you could be uh, you, you you could be a consumer picking more forest or soil friendly produce you could be somebody doing supplies on it or uh, you know you could be uh, helping with logistics for uh, regenerative agriculture or whatever, right? You, you could you could be supporting causes like this. You could be doing better soil and water management. So in in whatever capacity you are, I mean the uh, the problems are so many that it also means we have infinite opportunities today. Thank you, thank you, all the participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for an outstanding and insightful presentation. Your presence is indeed a source of great motivation for us. We are very much delighted to have you as a resource person for our webinar.
Thank you very much on behalf of the Department of Botany. You have joined our webinar. Thank you very much all the participants for your precious time to join the webinar. Now I would like to call Dr. N.C. David to give formal vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of Botany. Thank you. Good afternoon. As a common saying goes, knowing what to do with time is the key to being productive. We had a very productive and informative session so far. The topic discussed today is very apt and more relevant as global warming and climatic change is the challenge faced by the world. Today's presentation has thrown light on approaches for climatic change. My sincere thanks to our resource person, Ms. Shubha Ramachandran from Bio Environmental Solution, Mr. Samit Sir, COE Brain Matter Foundation for their eloquent and elusive presentation for their valuable time. I thank our beloved principal, Dr. Sister Lalita Thomas, for her constant support and guidance. I thank the management and our chief coordinator of science, Dr. Sitvi Etendran. I especially thank our college, IT team, and the technical staff for their kind cooperation. I thank all the participants for their active participation and well-being. Participants, to receive the EAT certificate, I request all the participants to submit the feedback form sent to your registered mail ID, and the feedback link will be shared in the chat box. Thanks, one and all, God bless. <laughs>